Hello, Jonathan. Hello. Hi, Kathleen. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? I cannot complain at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will use follow your instructions now. So, Alt-Tab. Yes, and I'm making sure they're all that you can share. I just changed okay. that. So we should be should be all set. Open my PowerPoint. Okay. So I'm on the first slide of the presentation. Do I need to start the slideshow yet? Yes, you do need to start the slideshow and then go ahead and, and use, go back to Zoom and do the share screen. Let's see. Again. All right. And now Oops. That went too quick. I want Hmm, I don't know what I want. What, what are you seeing right now? I'm seeing, seeing my email. I'm seeing the open Zoom meeting. <laughs> I'm seeing you. I'm seeing the PowerPoint, and then I'm seeing a blank. Oh, okay. Did you already? You have already clicked on uh, screen share or share screen. Where is that? It's at the very bottom of your. Um, of your screen, the Zoom screen. And if it's not there, you may have to move your mouse pointer over the bottom to have it pop up. Are you on a Windows PC or? I am. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing any bottom bar, which is odd. Okay, you should see a bar that starts with mute, stop yeah. video. Okay, and I towards the center. I've, I've seen that before and I'm not seeing it now. Okay, well, again, it will, so on some, depending on the setting, it'll disappear. And so you need to hover your mouse pointer over the bottom of the yep. Zoom screen. Doing that. Okay. Are you seeing it there? No. I'm going to, oh, here we go. When share you, screen. When you actually share screen, the, that menu will probably jump to the top. Okay. <clears throat> Just. Be prepared. <laughs> All right. And I don't need to share computer audio. Right. If you have no audio select... or no sound to it, you don't have to. Right. Do that. So I have picked the window I want to share and then click the share button. Share. Yeah. How's that? That's good. Good. All right. I'm going to turn this over to the, to the driver now. Here's John. <laughs> Sounds like we have people joining. Okay, we'll give people another few minutes before we start. Jonathan, can you hear me okay? Uh, you're a little soft. Okay, let me, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, my chair is kind of far away from the, I'm turning my volume up too that helps. <laughs> so is that better now? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Jonathan, I think you've met John before on Zoom, but here this is John and hello, Jonathan. How are you? I'm just admitting people as they come here. <clears throat> Turn off that little chime so that it doesn't disrupt you when you start presenting. Okay. 
Now, Kathleen and John, I, I have not muted everybody as they come in. So they'll, uh, if you want them all to mute themselves, we can ask them to do that or whatever works best for you. Okay, I, if, I think it's fine if people would like to just chime in and ask a question as we go along. Okay, sounds good. No. Well, Lynn and Pat and Nick and Chris. For those of you who are joining, we're waiting another four or five minutes before, before we start. Wait until it's uh, two o'clock, heads up. Just be careful you don't go off the table. Right. Oh, it's nice. Maybe I'll leave it like that. <laughs> I'm using my phone. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, Anita. Hi, how are you? Nice to Good. see you. I'll be right back. I gotta go get something, of course. Beautiful photograph. I see a whole bunch of them. I haven't seen you in a while, Steve. Well, that's true. I've been out uh, doing other things. I thought it was just me. I thought I was gone. The absent one. mention it now and hopefully remember to mention later that uh, on November 2nd, Robert Sin is going to do a session on uh, a photo travel sig session on China. He and his wife spent a month there. And, uh, so that should be interesting. Is that at two o'clock, Jonathan, too? Yes, yeah, I'll be the same time. November 2nd. Yes, correct. Okay, got it. And at this point, it'll be on Zoom again. We'll just keep planning the next one being to be on Zoom until we have better, better uh, COVID news. Oh. <clears throat> Everybody enjoying our cooler weather? Absolutely. Yep. Especially the dog. 
<laughs> yeah. It's good uh, walking weather. Wear a light jacket and you don't get overheated. How you doing, Kathleen? So doing you. well. Yeah, nice to see you. Actually, isolation agrees with me. <laughs> Eve. And we're glad to have your husband, too. Yes. So, Steve, can yes. I get a quick Althea update? Yes, she has her PhD. Yes. <laughs> Finally, she, after 12 years or something like that. Well, she beat my record. <laughs> <laughs> is she still living in Alabama? Yes, she is. She's a full-time uh, aerospace engineer now. Excellent. Oh. oh, wow. Cool. That's impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. Quietest group. <laughs> I guess we can just meditate for one more minute. Actually, my clock turned to two o'clock, so um, I'll let Dick Stein in. He just arrived. <laughs> and uh, once he shows up, uh, let's turn it over to Kathleen and John for their uh, photo tour of uh, Iceland. And thank you very much for doing this. Oh, that's truly our pleasure. <laughs> we had a lot of fun preparing. Okay. It, the floor is yours. Okay, well, uh, I always wanted to go to Iceland, and Kathleen really had kind of interest in that, too. And uh, I've always wanted to like taking pictures of nature, so this was uh, a real opportunity for both of us to go and, and enjoy this. It is, uh, it was the Land of the Midnight Sun was the name of the tour that we went on. It was a photographic workshop uh, conducted by a couple of professional photographers, and Kathleen will talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. So I will get started here, and I hope you all like uh, waterfalls because there are a lot of them in Iceland. <laughs> uh, all, all, of, all of the pictures that you're going to see, almost all of them, not quite all of them, but almost all of them, were taken with a single lens reflex digital camera. And uh, they were all taken in the raw format. And if there's time at the end and people have interest, we can talk about the difference between raw and JPEG, but I won't try to go into those uh, at this time. Uh, this is Iceland. It's an island. It's on the Atlantic Ridge, which means that half of it is on the tectonic plate for Europe, and the other is on the tectonic plate for North America. And so Iceland is slowly being split apart and that's why there's so much volcanic activity here uh, uh, up far north. It makes, makes for very interesting features. And our topic today is, is photography, so we're not gonna get a whole lot into cultural and, and other demographic issues. But I've tried to outline here where we've been spending, where we spent our days uh, doing our photographs uh, as we go around the ring road. And the ring road is the red road to circle around Iceland. Uh, the guidebooks say it doesn't matter whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise because you're going to end up at the same place either way. And it's uh, to give you an idea of size, the ring road in its totality is 825 miles. 
So that's the trip that we're going to take today. Obviously, we took some side trips here and there, but, but uh, that's basically what we did. Uh, I'm going to start off with a photograph that shows you one of the reasons it's good to have uh, photographic experts with you on your tour. When you get to a place that you're excited about, haven't ever seen before, you jump off the bus at the first stop, want to take pictures, it's raining, and so you put on your equipment to make sure you, you keep your camera you clean. And if you look at the upper right and left-hand corners of this, you'll see it's all white. Well, that's because the little rain hood that I put on my camera and lens was hanging over the front of the lens. And I was so excited, I was just focused on the uh, waterfall here and uh, forgot to check the corners and the edges like you're really supposed to when you take photographs. But I was only on my third exposure when one of the workshop leaders came up and said, oh, by the way, you might want to take this off the front of your, <laughs> your lens and clear it out a little bit. So it's nice to have people watching out for you so you can catch the mistakes early. Uh, but here's a picture of more of the waterfalls here. And up in the upper left corner, I've tried to put on, label these slides as to their location. This is Hranfossar. And uh, in, in Icelandic, Foss means fossil, And Fossar is the plural of that, so the water falls. And the water that's making these falls is just coming to the surface. It's been traveling underground for quite a ways, and this is where it comes out and uh, falls into the stream and, and runs on down. And we did have rain off and on quite a bit throughout the, the trip, but this was our first stop on the what first. The, what, what were the dates that your trip was? We were there uh, about the last week in June and the first week of July. Of uh, this year? No, this was 2018. Thank you. Yes, the, the, we did not travel this year. We actually canceled a couple of trips this year. <laughs> Most of us have. Yeah. <laughs> 2018. That evening, we were uh, on a peninsula, the Snefelsnes Peninsula. And we can see that a little later when we look at Iceland again. And this is the Kirkjufell Foss. That's an upper and lower falls. And as you can see, I've used a slow shutter speed here to really kind of uh, get things uh, slowed down so that we can have a silky waterfall as, a, as opposed to seeing the drops in frozen in, in motion there. And uh, I'll, I'll be showing you some different things that we've, we've done uh, to try to uh, make things a little bit instructional, but not a lot. Uh, and I'm actually going to, let's see if I can back up here. Uh, yeah, I, I can't see it too well on this. We've got with the zoom, but if you look up in this area, you can see there's a, a rope. And if you look closely, you can also see there's some asphalt path up there. And this picture is, was taken as is in the raw format uh, in the camera without any post-processing done to it. And then this picture was after post post-processing in Photoshop and uh, Lightroom. And I have removed those, uh, the, the rope and the asphalt paths up in that upper right-hand corner. And that's something you can do. To me, it was a little distracting because as you look at the falls, my eye kind of tends to go up toward the upper right as I look at this. And that was distracting to see those things up there. I did not remove the same things in the upper left because my eye doesn't normally go there and I just didn't take the effort to do that. But you can still see some rope and railing up in the upper left if you look at that. And so you can be selective about that. And then also with RAW, you can enhance the image the way you want to in, in make it brighter, change the colors, do whatever you want. And this was what I thought looked like a better picture than that first one did. This is the upper fall, the same place with uh, Kirkjafell itself, and fell means mountain in, in Icelandic, and it's the most famous and most photographed mountain in Iceland, and so the falls and the mountain are right there together, and uh, th this picture was uh, taken about 11 o'clock at night, wow. and this is part of why we talk about the, the midnight sun, is, uh, and we'll see more examples of that as we get a little uh, further along. 
And as you can see, it was quite cloudy, the clouds obscuring the top of the mountain there. The next day we headed down to the other side of the peninsula. And uh, this is Gat Couture, which is a naturally formed uh, stone arch there in the ocean, again, using a long shutter speed. One of the things that the guides, uh, the workshop leaders told us and gave us a lot of information about was using graduated or using neutral density filters. And those are basically just a dark piece of glass. Very, various levels of darkness are available so that you can cut down on how much light is coming into the camera so you can slow down the shutter speed. Again, so you can blur motion such as the water motion here in the surf that's going. And so this was probably with about a, either a three or six stop neutral density filter. And if you look up on the, the formation itself, all the little white spots, those are gulls. So those are, those are birds out in the ocean uh, making little, little snowflakes. <laughs> this is a picture that I took. So anytime you see pictures of photographers, that's me with my iPhone. Uh, taking pictures of people taking pictures. So the person who's in the front with the camera, you can see that's some pretty fancy camera equipment. He's taking a picture of our tour bus and our two guides. The fellow who's facing us in the black jacket, his name is Edwin Martinez. He's from the Philippines and he leads uh, tours all over the world, but he also works for our Icelandic photo tours. Uh, the fellow in the blue jacket, his name is Raymond Hoffman. Uh, he's from Germany and he came to Iceland and was uh, leading tours for Icelandic photo tours. And he fell in love with uh, an Icelandic girl. So he and this woman married, they have a family and this is what they do now. Uh, one of the really cool things about this tour is there were all levels of photographic expertise. And there were at least two of us who were only taking uh, uh, photos on our cell phones. And we received equal instruction with all of the other people on the tour. So it was really cool. And you can see this bus sits up pretty high and got big tires. And that's because this bus was capable of going to, into the interior of Iceland, which we didn't because it was still too early in the season. They hadn't opened the roads into the interior yet. But in the interior, there are a number of rivers, but there are zero bridges. Oh. So if you're going to travel, you have to ford the rivers. And this vehicle was capable of doing that uh, safely in that back area. And there are quite a few roads in Iceland that are, uh, if you don't have four-wheel drive, you're absolutely positively not allowed to drive on. And so that's, uh, I'm interested in getting back to Iceland so we can go into the interior, into that area that's so remote and so really desolate. Well, this is another photographer. This is John setting up to take a, a photograph. So in a minute, you'll see the photograph he was setting up for. And this is a focus stacking shot. And this is something that the, the, the tour leaders, uh, workshop leaders really uh, schooled us on. And as you can see, it's, it's got fairly good focus from front to back. This was my first attempt at focus stacking. So there are quite a number of things that can be improved on. But basically, this so you take a shot like this where you can get the flowers in the, in the foreground uh, kind of in focus there. And then you can get some a little further back that are in focus. And then you can get another one with the church in focus. And you put them all together and you get this. And again, that's using the software in, uh, in Photoshop. And, uh, and in Lightroom, you can do things like this to put those together. So this was my first attempt. And there, so there's a lot of learning that took place there that I've been applying since then to uh, keep working on the skills that the instructors gave us uh, on this little trip. And the, there, if you look about the middle on the left, that's the Snaefells in this peninsula. That's where we were taking those pictures that we just looked at. And on day four, we left that peninsula and started heading up to the northeast uh, a little more. As we left our hotel that morning, we had this shot. And this was between, oh, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock in the morning. It was uh, heavy fog, uh, quite a bit of rain going on, at least a light rain. 
And so this was the first shot taken straight out of the camera. I didn't do anything to this shot. Uh, this is just the way the raw picture came out. And then by using, again, the post-processing, you can enhance things that you want to. And if, if you look closely, you can see this is actually a double rainbow. It's a little faint, but there is a double rainbow there. And if we go back, it's Let's see it. kind of there, but it's not quite as noticeable. And so by, again, enhancing things with post-processing, uh, you can get to, to this point, which is a little bit better, in my opinion. Uh, another thing we learned to deal with were raindrops. If you look in the upper right corner of this picture, you can see the drops in the picture uh -huh. up on the rocks. And uh, after seeing this, and I could see it on my viewfinder or, or in the, on the LED on the on LCD on the back of the camera, I said, well, I need to make some adjustments here. I actually changed my framing and pointed the lens down a little bit more to kind of keep the moisture from coming in from the rain that was occurring at the point at that point. And uh, oh wow, got, got this picture then again using uh, longer shutter speeds to kind of blur the water a little bit and then a little bit of post-processing to enhance the, the contrast in it. And uh, this was a little waterfall that if you didn't know it was there, you probably would never stop and look at it. Uh, again, a benefit of having locals that know, the, know their work, know the, know the area, so they can stop here and get off and take a few pictures. So this was, and we were just kind of on our way out of the area. This is a colophos, and colophos, uh, co colo, is actually uh, a troll. And the troll is said to have created this gorge that this is in, and it actually, the, the troll has stored its treasure under one of the mountains, and it's set traps so that people can't find the treasures. Trolls are very common in Iceland, and as are fairies. And so there are lots of stories about these things, and... Uh, so this was uh, a nice little waterfall, and it was in a, just off a kind of little gravel road, tiny little bridge to go across. And this shot was actually taken from that little bridge, which was, you had to be careful because if anybody was going to come in a car across the bridge, there was barely room for them to get by if you were standing there. So uh, it was interesting experiences. Well, this is taken by me again, because you can see there are photographers in there. And these, this was a, uh, Heard of Icelandic horses. The fellow that's in front in blue, he was from Germany. Uh, he had been on many trips with the Icelandic photo tours. And one of the things uh, that was fun to listen to him talk about was his trip to Iceland to shoot the Northern Lights in the dead of winter. So there were a lot of a different experiences you could get. And the, uh, you can see the rider in the background there. Oh, and I want to point out the person in green in this picture is Bob. And Bob and Marianne were a couple from Dallas, Texas that were on the trip. And we actually got to be pretty good friends with them. And we've traveled with them since and have some trips planned in the future with them. And oh. uh, he'll come in to, to mention here in just a few minutes. Uh, this shows a little closer picture of a rider on the horse. You can see that the horses are maybe a little smaller than we're used to seeing. And it is a, a small breed. And the breed was brought to Iceland by uh, Norwegian people out of Norway uh, around the year 1000, maybe 900. And by the year 1000, the governing body of Iceland had passed a law saying it is illegal to bring any other breed of horse into Iceland. As a result, for over a thousand years, this is the only breed in Iceland. They've been isolated. And now it's still illegal uh, to bring other breeds in. Also, if any of these horses are taken out of the country, they can never come back to Iceland. They're worried about the genetic diversity, or the genetic strain, obviously, but also they don't want any diseases brought in from anywhere else that would threaten the, the population. Uh, also, these horses are pretty famous for having five different gates. Most breeds of horse have three. These have five. One of them is a very fast but very smooth gait, which is very easy to ride. It's not jolting at all. 
And then they have one that is called a flying gate because of how fast it goes. Wow. A little bit about the, the horses. You can obviously get a lot more information online if you're interested. I do have a couple more pictures. Uh, this is one that I took, and this was later in the day. This isn't the same group of horses. This is when we were headed out to see another troll that we'll show you in a minute. And I took this picture, and Bob and I, after we got back to the United States, kind of collaborated on pictures here and there. We would share pictures, and, and uh, he would be in Dallas, and I'd be here, and we'd look at our computers, and we would compare notes, and then we would say, well, try this in, in Photoshop, or try this, try this. He said, I think this would really look good as a black and white photo. So we converted it to black and white and compared notes. And uh, I kind of still like the color one myself, but Bob really liked the black and white one. And so those are, again, some of the nice things about going on a tour like this is you meet like-minded people that you can then have a relationship with even long distance uh, over the years. And it's a lot of fun. Okay, this is the troll we were headed to when we saw those horses. Uh, and trolls turn to stone if they don't make it home before the sun comes out. So if sunlight hits a troll, they turn to stone. And so that's what happened here uh, to make this picture. And again, I would never have thought to take this picture if it hadn't been for one of the leaders in the workshop. And he was calling us all up one by one because there's not much room up here <laughs> to take the picture. And so we would get our tripod set up almost down in the water and one leg on one side of the stream, one leg on the other <laughs> and lean over and uh, take the picture. But it does make, again, what the leaders tell us, look for leading lines, look for things in the picture, your composition that lead the eye up toward your subject. And so this stream kind of does that. And again, the little valley that it's in. And so that's a leading line up to the, to the frozen troll. And this is the troll from down uh, at, uh, on the beach. And these pictures were taken uh, around 10.30 at night. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, yeah. I was going to double check that. It's... Uh, it was actually 1110 <laughs> is when that picture was taken. And it's cloudy too. So uh, uh, we, when we were there, sunset and sunrise were an hour apart. So it didn't really get dark. <laughs> so the next day we headed across the Northern part for days five and six and uh, took some some more pictures in this area. This is a glam bear, which is a, a museum. Uh, and there's a church in the background. Now, this is a museum of turf houses. And when the Icelanders settled here back in the about 800s, they lived in turf houses. And as a matter of fact, in this museum area, one of these turf houses was actually inhabited until 1947. Wow. <laughs> and so and they're still being kept up obviously again this is the picture straight out of the camera uh, taken in the raw without any kind of processing were you the the map showed essentially two of the solid red lines that are the roads one was very close to the coast and the other one was further inland which road yeah we're on the one further inland okay Thank you. That's the that's the ring road itself. The other road it go up and around different places, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't get up on into those. Uh, that would obviously have taken quite a bit longer to cover all that area. But yeah, that that's a good question. That the ring road is the inner road here, uh, going around. Okay. Thank you. So here's the uh, the same picture after some processing. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Lightroom to get a little more contrast in the sky and brighten things up a little bit. I took this picture. <laughs> <laughs> I collected these warning signs as I went around <laughs> and we were walking around. And I love this one in particular. Uh, people 
are foolish everywhere. And we actually saw two rescues from people who ignored these signs and, oh. you know, stepped over the line. Uh, they have to bring in helicopters and they have to bring in boats to, oh. to get people out. So it has a little sense of humor, I think. <laughs> and of course, people taking selfies uh, doesn't really make things safer. <laughs> It's kind of like when you're taking pictures and say, why don't you take another step back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ooh, and this beautiful. is a place where it, that sign might be a pretty good thing to pay attention to. Uh, this is uh, close to the highlands. As a matter of fact, the road we took in here had a gate off of one side where a road went off to the side. And that gate was closed because the highlands weren't open yet. And so this was up close. And you notice the striations, the, like the columns mm -hmm. on either side of the waterfall. Those are basaltic columns that they actually form in hexagons. So those, those columns are hexagons. When the basalt cools after a volcanic eruption, they form in this, this shape. And there are a number of, I, of these locations in Iceland, as well as other parts of the world. One of the more famous locations is the... the uh, Giant's Causeway, I want to say Devils, but the Giant's Causeway off the northern coast of Northern Ireland. Right. And, uh, so that's, that's quite an impressive uh, formation there. Yes, I was is. lucky enough for just two or three minutes, the little uh, rainbow appeared on the side of this waterfall, and I was able to get one of the, the with that in it. Cool. Now, this church on the left, Holgrim's Kirchia, which is uh, in, in uh, Reykjavik, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, completed in 1986, and it took 40 years to build. It's all concrete. And they used the theme of the basaltic columns mm -hmm. as the theme for the church. Right. So you can see the same type of formation there. And uh, the architect very much wanted to do that to make it be very much a part of Iceland. And that's Leif Erikson in the statue there, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, that statue was donated to uh, Iceland uh, from the United States oh. a number of years ago. And there's a, just the picture itself, a very popular place. There are always lots of people here, got a fantastic organ in the inside and they were playing a, 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 the organ while we were there. And it was just really a very pleasant thing. And you can take an elevator all the way to the top and get a very good view of a lot of Iceland from up there. This is back to the picture that was on the uh, title slide. Uh -huh. This is uh, Gothafoss. Uh, and the story behind this, the way it got its name, Waterfall of the Gods, is around the year 1000, Iceland was under rule from Norway. And the king of Norway told the Icelanders, look, guys, get your act together. You need to be a Christian nation. They were still pagan at the time. The Norse gods and so on with their heritage from, the, from Nor Norway and that area. This particular picture is actually two exposures. They were taken in the vertical format, not horizontal. And then they were blended together into a panorama to get wow. the uh, range that I wanted and again, taken uh, at a slow shutter speed. This picture was taken around one o'clock in the morning. And uh, obviously no flash or anything, but you can see the color in the sky a little bit. It was a little cloudy still, so we didn't need a lot of color, but we got some. And uh, so, but those shots were then combined in Lightroom to, to get this picture. You guys didn't get much sleep. <laughs> On this particular night, we checked into the hotel around two o'clock in the morning. But they let us sleep until nine or ten, you know. So that's not so bad. <laughs> it was an exciting time. Uh, but the, the waterfall of the gods came about because uh, in the ruling party or the ruling body, they really argued about this thing of to be Christian or stay pagan, and they finally gave the uh, responsibility to one person, one of the leaders in the ruling uh, governing body. And he uh, meditated on it for 24 hours. And he decided that, well, we will become a Christian nation. 
but if people want to worship the pagan gods, they can do so in their own homes. Shortly thereafter, he converted to Christianity, and he lived up in this area, and he brought his pagan idols with him and threw them over the waterfall, mm -hmm. thus the waterfall of the gods. Uh, the next day, we were out and about, and this is a power plant uh, near Lerinkukur, which is a, a thermal area, and uh, up until the 70s, Iceland got almost all of their electricity and power from uh, uh, oil and gas that they imported. Wow. So they had to import all of their energy, basically. And we all remember the 70s when uh, gasoline got really high and the speed limit dropped to 55 and so on and so forth. And Iceland said, we cannot really deal with this vastly fluctuating price in oil. And so they started looking around for what they could do. Well, they obviously have geothermal power. With all those waterfalls, they obviously have a lot of hydroelectric. Now they're almost 100% of their electricity comes from renewable energy. And about 80 to 85% of the homes are heated with geothermal power. About the only thing they use uh, petroleum products for is uh, gasoline and diesel for their vehicles. Almost everything else they use power wise comes from right there in Iceland on renewable resources. You know if they're converting to electric cars? Uh, I do not. All of their cars are imported, obviously. They don't have any vehicles okay. that the factories in there in Iceland. Uh, but I, I do not know. I don't recall that topic coming up. But I would think they probably do because they obviously have the electricity. Mm. They also have some interesting air quality uh, mm. in these geothermal areas. There's yep. a lot of sulfur, mm -hmm. hydrogen sulfide. And Kathleen was pretty sensitive to that. And so she was trying to protect herself. And here we see the lava fields from uh, eruptions that happened many years ago. And you can still see quite a bit of steam coming up out of that area. And this was a large, large area here uh, in this uh, thermal area. And obviously not much growing here. This is not a black and white photo either. <laughs> yeah, this is as much color as there was. <laughs> then the next day, we saw some similar things to this so on day seven as we work our way over toward the East Coast. And this is a mud pot, again, and where I don't know if you say that, how to say that right or not, but anyway. This is an area that has a lot of uh, uh, fumaroles and mud pots. And sometimes the mud pots make pretty interesting little features here. Mm -hmm. And I thought this little animal looking at me was pretty cute. So <laughs> it just happened to be there when that mud made that formation. And then it was gone. And you have to wait for something else. But I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, here are the fumaroles. Obviously, a lot of people in this area, too, they do have uh, again, the stakes with the ropes around them to try to keep people in somewhat safe areas. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. This is John uh, setting up to take a photograph of a fumarole, and they build, people build these uh, stone stacks up around the hot spots uh, so that people don't walk into them and kill themselves. Since, since they opened this up for tourism, they thought that'd be a good idea to uh, not, not let people walk right up to the brink to look in. Oh, yeah. And then there's the picture I, I took uh, without the people in it. Uh, and I like the sky there, but the, that's a big pile of rocks to keep people away. This is uh, Betafoss, another quite uh, famous uh, waterfall. And this one discharges at around 3 million gallons per minute. So there's a lot of water coming over, a lot of, of uh, power there, a lot of mist coming back up out of the valley from the bottom of the waterfall. And if you look 
carefully on the left bank, there are people over there. But we'll, we'll take another look at those in a minute. This is a picture from down lower, more uh, eye level with the river coming in to where the waterfall is. You can really see the mist coming up out of there. And the people are still over there on that other bank. And if we do a zoom in a little bit, it becomes a little more obvious. So that gives you a sense of scale of how big this waterfall really is. And why those people are getting pretty close to it on the other side. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure they don't want to fall in. Because that would, uh, I don't think there would be any rescue there. That is one of the largest waterfalls in the world. In terms of volume. Then we worked our way on over to the east coast uh, to a, a puffin colony. Uh, puffins are only on land uh, during the breeding season when they raise their young. The whole rest of the year they're out in the ocean gathering up these little fish. So here's one of the parents with a beak full of fish and the little burrow is back behind. They, their nests are in burrows. They dig these holes into the side of the hill and uh, that's where the, the pufflings are. They're not chicks, they're pufflings. And that is the official name of their chicks, is pufflings. Yep. You oh. can also then zoom in on a picture like that. And again, using by taking a raw picture, you get a lot more detail, a lot better information to work with. And so you can zoom in and you can see then the little uh, fish that they have in their, in their beaks and their cute little eyes. And uh, so this is the, the Atlantic puffin. And here's one with the uh, picture uh, uh, backlighting on the, the feathers on the wings. And all of these pictures were taken around 10 o'clock at night. And this is my picture of the photographers taking pictures of the puffins. <laughs> So they had, yes, yeah, so you see they had a platform there for people to use if they wanted to, and it was uh, well set up for what we did. And it's a remote, extremely small area. Then we start heading down the coast, and we did a lot of traveling this day, so there aren't a whole lot of pictures uh, left. But this is a picture that was uh, along the way, a mid mid morning, late late to mid morning to late morning. This when this was taken, and so there's, and it was clear. So there's a lot of sunlight, a lot of harsh sunlight, a lot of contrast. Not a time of day you normally want to be taking pictures. But again, using techniques that the workshop leaders help us learn about is a one called HDR, and that's high dynamic range. And what that does is it lets you take three pictures of the same thing: underexposed, overexposed and the metered exposure. So you try to get different things correctly exposed in the different pictures because film and, and digital media don't have the ability like our eyes do to look at something in high contrast and still see everything clearly. And so by using HDR, we can take these three pictures and again, using the software in Lightroom or Photoshop, blend them together and get something where virtually everything is in a proper exposure. That's a really nice tool to have and be able to use in practice. Then on the next day, we again are traveling down that uh, southeast side over to uh, Glacial Lagoon. There's a very, very large glacier just north of this area. And this lagoon is where the, the calving of the glacier goes into. You can see these icebergs have been here for quite a while. They're well weathered. They have some dirt on them, so they've been around a while. There's a little bird between the, well, it's not that, that little a bird, but there's a bird between the two of them that gives you an indication of, of the size of these. And this was at a location called Diamond Beach because all of the ice is crystal clear for diamonds. This was held up for me uh, by our bus driver. His name was Aether. He would tell us stories as he was driving the bus about over there is where this troll was doing this thing and got caught by sunlight. You can see them now. So he added a lot to the trip. 
And, and before we went out uh, to Diamond Beach, and Diamond Beach is where that glacial lagoon discharges into the Atlantic Ocean. So they're right there together. And our, our workshop leaders gave us ideas on, well, what kind of shutter speed should you use? Uh, how should you set up? They provided knee boots for us so we could get out into the surf. And they also provided the duct tape to tape the tops of the knee boots around our legs so that if we got a little too far out in there, the water wouldn't come up over and fill our boots. So that was nice to have, have that. And so using their advice on what kind of exposure to use, and, and again, using neutral density filters to slow things down, we can get a nice blur in uh, some of the surf while still getting sharpness in uh, some of the icebergs. And you can see some of them like it there in the background are, are white, but others are really this crystal like Kathleen just mentioned on for the Diamond Beach. Also notice the black uh, sand. That's fairly common in this part of Iceland. I remember a story I read in something that a fellow from Iceland had traveled to Hawaii and there's a beach there that has black sand. Yep. And the locals were saying, oh, you really got to go out. This is really neat. There's a black sand beach. He said, so I see that all the time. <laughs> he was not impressed. <laughs> and here's another exposure, uh, a little bit different composition uh, of the same type of thing. Uh, getting the swirling, it almost, it looks black and white, but obviously the blue iceberg there, crystal in the middle, it, it's not. But uh, that's how it looks when you get the surf on that black sand beach. And this was, I think, the 2nd of July. June 30th. June 30th. Okay, <laughs> I, I actually haven't labeled there. Okay. Uh, June 30th, and Kathleen's rather bundled up. And she's also nice enough to carry my backpack that has my extra lenses and camera gear in it for me when we're out like this. So that's, that's really nice to have. But yeah, June 30th, and it's obviously not a warm day. This, oh. is, <laughs> this is a photograph that uh, one of the instructors, Edwin, came over and said, you, you can always make a cool photograph if you take a photo through something. So he found this piece of ice was on the beach. And he said, take a picture of John through this aperture. And everybody else uh, on the tour said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And they all came up. John was not allowed to leave. <laughs> he had to stay there while everybody else on the tour, I guess there were 12 of us total yep. on the tour, yeah. uh, got this shot lined up and took it. So that was an example of uh, the instructors really catering to the equipment and the level we were at for improving our photography. And this was another uh, glacial lagoon, just a little bit further along. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you can see three people standing there. Again, gives you a little sense of scale. Uh, so sometimes you want people in the picture to do that. Other times you want people out of the picture because you don't want them messing up what you're trying to take a picture of. But uh, I thought this looked pretty neat having those three tiny little people down there to give us a sense of scale. Then we travel quite a long ways the next day and day 10 is getting pretty close to the end of the trip. And it was raining, of course. <laughs> This uh, waterfall is actually a, about three quarters of a mile away from the parking area. And it's kind of, it's through a sheep pasture with rocky, hilly, muddy terrain. And so I think Kathleen and another decided they would not make the trip all the way down to the waterfall. <laughs> they stayed back and visited, I think. But uh, this particular picture, I think I used a 10 stop neutral density filter which gave me a 20 second exposure. And I'll tell you about a trick I learned from my, one of the workshop leaders in just a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, this was trying to use a leading line to let the stream kind of lead your eye up into the waterfall itself. And the, one of the leaders was set up right next to me on this stream, taking a picture of his own. And I noticed he kept putting his hand up and doing something out with his camera lens. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm keeping the moisture off my lens. And by using a 10 or 20 second exposure, 
if you just take a second or two to wipe something, that's not long enough for that to show up on the picture. <laughs> and so I learned that little trick of, well, you don't have to take extreme measures to try to keep the water off. You just have to keep wiping it off if you have a long exposure. So that was another nice trick to learn. Uh, here is a closer picture of the fall. And you see the little magenta and blue pick spots there. Those are people from our, our group. Oh. This was a waterfall you can actually walk behind. And there are several falls in Iceland that you can do that with. And so I didn't walk behind it myself, but I think they got some pretty interesting shots looking back out the other way from behind the waterfall. And here is in the town of Vik, there is a church and you can see it's up on a hill. If you look down in the foreground, that's much lower elevation. And this is the area of Iceland where they can get volcanic eruptions under the glaciers. And when that happens, they can get tremendous floods, very fast moving floods that are very destructive. This church is a place where the people, local people can go to be safe. It'll get them out, up, out of where the uh, flow would go. And they have an, a very extensive and reliable warning system in Iceland for when these things might happen. Uh, but most of the people that live in this area don't need it all that much because <laughs> they have sheep and cattle and they have animals. And all those animals know what's going to happen before the warning systems do. And so by watching their animals, they know what's coming and they can take action uh, to be safe even before the official warning goes out. So I thought that was pretty interesting. John? Yes. What were the purple flowers in that picture? Those are lupins. Okay. Just like, you know, the, the purple, we have those in the United States too. And I, if, right. I think, although I'd have to research it again, I think those are actually introduced in Iceland. Hmm. So I don't think those are native to Iceland. And I think they've kind of taken over in some places. But yeah, those, those fields are really nice. A lot of lupins. And those are the same lupins that were in the, when I showed you the picture of the focus mm -hmm. stacking, right. those were the same types of, of uh, lupins. Okay. Oh, I'm going Forward. the wrong way. There, you go. there we go. I'm going the wrong way. That's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the waterfalls that a lot more people see than the ones we've been looking at. That's because this is on the south side, very close to Rinkiewicz. So a lot of people will fly into Reykjavik and they just want to take day trips. You can easily come out and see this and go back. And this was one of them, the nice flowers in the foreground. And again, it was a, a rainy day. We have quite a few of those. <laughs> and I loved this trip. At this point in the trip, I was kind of done with and with rain. And this is my photograph of raindrops through the bus window. <laughs> but as you can see there are quite a few cars in the parking area here and it's a, obviously a well-maintained parking area all asphalt it does get a lot of traffic and this is another waterfall right very close in the same area and you can see the people in the foreground out in their rain gear because it's raining and of course you get a lot of spray off the waterfall itself and so uh, from this point, then we made it back into Reykjavik. We were glad to get to the hotel and, and dry off and uh, have a nice dinner with the group that night and recap the, the entire trip. So that was our, that was our trip. And uh, if there are questions, I think we probably have a little bit of time left. Mm -hmm. John and Kathleen, uh, those are gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. Thank you. And well organized and presented. Uh, what was the variation of temperature while you were there? Uh, I would say, Kathleen can chime in too, but my guess it was primarily from the low 40s up into the low 60s. Wow, that cold. Okay. Yeah, it, we didn't. That's warm for Iceland. Yeah, that's, yeah but we, we didn't uh, have any heat days. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kathleen and John, if you go to the top of your screen, you can probably stop the screen share, uh, close the window to the PowerPoint. And, yeah, exactly. Could I ask uh, which lenses you used and which lenses you took that you didn't use? <laughs> uh, 
I planned very carefully. I took three lenses. I did use all three. I used a 16 to 35, 16 millimeter to 35 millimeter for the wider wide angles, a uh, 24 to 120 for more of the medium parts and a short telephoto. And then for pictures like the Puffins, I used a 70 to 200. Ah, wonderful. Now that was the longest lens I took because I knew I was going to do, be doing mostly landscape. Yes. Did you download your, your raw images to a laptop every night or did you save them on SD cards? I, uh, I, I carry uh, external hard drives. And every night I would uh, make two copies, one uh, to two different hard drives, and then reformat the uh, cards that I use in the camera. So I always have at least two copies. Wonderful. So those, uh, those hard drives were in the backpack that you made Kathleen carry around all the time? <laughs> uh, actually, I keep one hard drive in the backpack and I keep one in the carry-on luggage. So that, that they aren't even in the same place. At this, so if I if I were to lose a bag, I didn't lose both hard drives. So if Kathleen goes over the edge somewhere, he's still got his photos. <laughs> the photos are protected. Yeah, that's great. One of the good things that we did uh, was not every night, but uh, uh, every other night, people would uh, send three of their photos into the uh tour leaders and then we would share those for kind of a group session on what could you do with this photo to enhance it so that was just a real nice opportunity to learn a lot about uh, post-processing as well as setting up your your photos what time of year would you have to go if you wanted to go into the interior uh, you need to go in mid to late July, mm -hmm. and it's really from, you know, that mid-July to about mid to late August, early September. Okay, that's the warmest time? Yeah, that, that's when the roads start opening up and you can get in and do some things. And it's, it's amazing if you get on the internet and look around and see what people do when they go to the interior. People have these very elaborate vehicles. Oh. where they actually have their tents on top of the vehicles and a little mm -hmm. ladder that goes up and they camp on top of their vehicles. Oh. And some of the people actually have these specialized vehicles that they take around the world with them. Really? They go to Africa, they go to Iceland, they go to different places and they actually have their vehicles shipped to those places oh. so that they can oh. use them in these very rough uh, remote areas. Yeah. Oh. So that, some of that's on the internet. It's pretty neat. Yes. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Truly wonderful. Yeah. Great Thank job. You. Thank Glad you. Thank you. Inspiring. <laughs> <laughs>